Tim's a professor at uh, the School of Social Work and he's director of the Centre for Inclusion and Citizenship at the University of British Columbia. So he holds a PhD from the London School of Economics on disability rights and social policy. Tim's consulted internationally and published widely on individualised funding, rights-based social service structures, supported decision making, disability rights, history, ethics and theory. Tim's very active in the disability rights movement and, in, and is a board member of the Canadian Association for Community and Chair of the CACL Values and Ethics Task Force. Tim lives in Tawasson in British Columbia, which is a beautiful part of Greater Vancouver. And he has four children, one of whom has an intellectual disability. So please welcome um, my friend, colleague and professor, Tim Stanton. What I'm going to try to do is, it's obviously a very big topic, so let's try to compress things. I'm going to start on a fairly high level and just talk about kind of what, uh, what are the underlying principles and why it's, it, it's a, a critical issue to engage with at this time. Uh, then I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what are the key sort of elements? Because it's, it's, it's a lot more complex than most people think. It's not just about changing a law, it's about changing a practice, about changing a worldview, about changing uh, a way we think about people who previously have been considered unable to make decisions. Uh, then I thought I would share with you briefly uh, the Representation Agreement Act, which was the first act really to address supported decision making in British Columbia and just give you a little bit of the nuts and bolts of that, show you how, how that plays out and then offer some suggestions on what are the key pieces to a supported decision making regime. So uh, I should also confess I am somewhat technologically challenged and I'm going to try to do my own slides in this one. So feel free to yell at me if I've forgotten to advance one or the other. Um, if I am using terminology or things that, that people want clarification with, feel free to just put up your hand and interrupt me. I, I, I have four children. I'm more than used to being interrupted. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, don't if you say, well, what the heck's that mean? feel free to interrupt and ask me to clarify. Okay, so obviously the the renewal of interest in supported decision making really stems from the passage of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, particularly Article 12, which is the, the article which acknowledges that persons with disabilities are persons before the law. It's an interesting phrase if you're not kind of used to, to the language that, that say, well, what were they before if they weren't persons before the law? Uh, but in fact, in law and in much of our philosophical tradition, people who were unable to formally express their will were in fact not considered persons. Uh, so the convention has the, the article in the convention has two kind of what I think are key points. Uh, so the first is this recognition of people being enjoying legal capacity on an eco basis with others in all aspects of life. And the second, that states parties should take all appropriate measures to provide access to persons with disabilities to support to the support they may require in exercising that legal capacity. So the article is very clear that it's not just about changing the law, it's about putting in place the structures and systems and supports that actually allow people to exercise that capacity within the legal framework. And I'm going to try to talk a bit about both, uh, and I know uh, Chris, so I'm, I'm really pleased to rejoin with. We've, we've done many things together over the years, and I know she's going to focus more on the practice side, I think. so. So the article was by far the most contentious article in the drafting of the convention. It barely made it in the convention. Uh, and the reason for that is because it really challenges one of the most fundamental 
philosophical and legal principles in the Western tradition. So just a couple of examples of that. This quote from John Locke, uh, but if through defects that may happen out of the ordinary course of nature anyone comes not to such a degree of reason wherein he might be supposed capable of knowing the law, he is never capable of being a free man. So lunatics and idiots are never set free from the government to their parents. Now we might say it differently today, but we say exactly the same thing today. Samuel Fufendorf was another political theorist at the time who actually uh, you Locke scholars in the crowd, but I'm sure there are many of you, would know this. John Locke was a very original thinker, but, but his real <coughs> achievement was he took ideas from others and synthesized them and put them into other places. So where he got a lot of his legal theory was from Pufendorf. Pufendorf put it this way, to make a man capable of giving a serious and firm consent it is above all things that he be master of his reason. If one is incurably lacking in reason, that he is in all legal and moral considerations to be accounted dead. Now, that sounds a little more dramatic to us than it actually is. The reference is to a concept called civil death, which is still a concept in law, uh, and it refers to losing your rights as a citizen. So it was, it was very common in uh, Greek city-states in Rome that if you committed a crime, you were sentenced to civil death. So you lost all of those rights. But I think it's a really powerful way of thinking about it, that this notion that you are dead as a citizen. And that's, again, unfortunately still would be the dominant systems in place in most jurisdictions. So, not surprisingly, that because it challenges these very fundamental things, uh, many, many countries in their ratification of the convention put a reservation on their understanding of certain articles. The most commonly was on Article 12. So Canada, for instance, uh, has a reservation that notes that they interpret the, the article that it permits both supported and substitute decision-making arrangements in appropriate circumstances and in accordance with the law. Similarly, Australia made this declaration on Article 12 that it understands that it allows for full supported or substituted decision-making arrangements which provide for decisions to be made on behalf of the person. But this is the important bit. Only where such arrangements are necessary as a last resort and subject to safeguard. So what they're saying, they're, they're putting out reservations, but they're saying it's not enough to simply add on supported decision making. That what the convention compels us to do is to reduce to an absolute minimum our use of substitute decision making. And that's a really important point, because as I'll get to in a moment, most countries have taken it more on the, well, we'll add a little bit of this on the side. But in most people's opinion, that will not lead to compliance with Article 12. So there's two kind of areas of action that, that jurisdictions need to be looking at in order to actually move forward on the actualization of 12. Uh, first is the law reform side, obviously. And there's really different pieces to that, so we need to think about the scope of it. Healthcare decision making, financial decision making, personal care decision making. We need to think how broadly it's going to apply in terms of people with intellectual disabilities, people with mental health difficulties, uh, people with cognitive disability, uh, cognitive deficiencies due to dementia and other uh, age related issues. Uh, and we need to think about the balance. All right, so in our whole system, how do we balance substituted and supported decision making in such a way so that the balance is very heavily weighted to a supported system? So that's one piece, and the other piece is really around the support. So it's fine to have our legal frameworks, but unless we have 
the kinds of supports on the ground. I, I assume I don't know a whole lot about ADA, but like ADA and organizations like that, that will support people to do it, but also on the ground. So people need communication support, things like uh, active support in terms of their day-to-day -day activity. Uh, so that decision making and supportive decision making comes embedded in our day-to-day -day practice. Another big piece, and this is a bigger piece for intellectual disability in most cases than it is for dementia in other areas, but is identifying and supporting the substitute decision makers. Many people with intellectual disabilities don't have the kinds of networks that would sustain a functional supported decision making regime. And, and that's not accidental. Part of the institutionalization process was to actively cut people off. That communication can be understood as an interpretive role. So if my, my son, for instance, if you met him, you wouldn't be able to understand what he said. Our family and folks who know him can understand him perfectly, whether that's his behavioral communication or whether that's his semi-formal communication. Uh, so the Act explicitly notes that someone's way of communicating is not grounds for deciding that he is incapable of understanding anything referred to in subsection 1, which is all the areas that the law covers. The second thing that's quite uh, important, I think, is this relational capacity idea. And it really comes in in this last line, which I'll put the right slide up. So section 8 says that the adult, that capacity should include whether the adult demonstrates choices and preferences and can express feelings of approval or disapproval of others, whether the adult has a relationship with the representative that is characterized by trust. So it has that element of they don't have to formally communicate so long as they can express preferences and that the supportive decision maker is someone where there is a clear, empirically verifiable to the point that's possible relationship of trust. Uh, and those are really, I think, the, the little gems in the act, if you like. So the rep agreement has two sections. The first section, section seven, is, is the most liberal section, if you like. Uh, it covers minor and major health care decision making, personal care decision making, legal affairs, and routine management of financial affairs. So by routine they mean banking, standard purchases, it wouldn't cover uh, major real estate purchases, stock investment purchases, but the day-to-day -day banking, RDSP, all of that stuff would be covered within routine financial affairs. So as I mentioned, there's no specific uh, understand the nature and effect capacity ruling really in this section. Uh, generally, it's done by people who are, are need the help today, need the support immediately, so it's not a future planning document so much. Uh, and one of, the, one of the beauties of it, I think, uh, is you don't require a lawyer or a notary. You can, it's simply done by witnessing. Um, so it's, it's very, very inexpensive to put together. Literally, you can establish one for $50 or less, uh, which is a major shift from, I don't know about here, but for us to get a guardianship order in Canada, legal fees would be between eight and $10,000. Uh, so that section is, say, the most liberal section, the broadest section of the Act. Uh, there is another section that covers uh, more complex decision making, and that's section 9. Uh, unfortunately, it reinstitutes the understand the nature and effect clause. So it, it's not enough simply to demonstrate the relationship. They have to be able to demonstrate that. Uh, 
it covers more complex health care or personal matters, uh, things like refusal of life-sustaining treatment, Ulysses overrides, experimental treatment, ECT restraint. So fairly, you know, fairly far out on the end, but unfortunately an end that a lot of people that we're concerned with find themselves at some time. So they are not covered by our current act under Section 7, but you can get a Section 9. So this is a section that's used predominantly by seniors or people in early stages of dementia will set them up so that they're covered as their cognitive impairment increases. Uh, so it's been very effective for that population, not so much for the intellectual disability population. Uh, everyone, everyone familiar with, you heard the term Ulysses agreements? Okay, Ulysses agreements are, they're a bit like an advanced care directive for people with uh, mental health issues. And it's, it's a Ulysses agreement, because the story of Ulysses, right? They, tied in the mask so he wouldn't be tempted by the sirens as he went by them. Um, it allows someone, say, someone with uh, manic depression. They know the signs when they're beginning to enter a manic phase. So they can put in an agreement that says, when I start to do A, B, and C, this agreement kicks in and so-and-so becomes my decision maker. But they can also say, but these are the things that I want and these are the things I don't want. So if there's particular medication they don't like, particular types of treatment, they can put that in the agreement. Or they can say, I would like them to do this. Uh, so those agreements are fairly, in mental health situations, fairly frequently embedded within a rep agreement. You can embed advanced directives, any other documents within it. Um, so the Ulysses override would be that if someone wants to, the supporter, supporter decision maker, wants to ignore something that's in one of those agreements, they would need a section 9 rather than a section 7. Okay, need to move along. Uh, so, I'm going to go fairly quickly through this. The Act allows for essentially three different roles. So there's the representative, the supported decision maker. Uh, you can appoint an alternate rep. You can appoint joint reps. You can have the reps be required to agree or to act independently. So you can set it up however works for you. Uh, and you can introduce a monitor. And in fact, for certain areas of decision making, you're required to have a monitor. And the monitor's job is simply to oversee, to make sure you are, in fact, choosing what your best estimation of what the person would choose, as opposed to choosing what you think is best for them. Um, so it's a bit of a, a safeguard that's in the Act, say, and it's up to you how you balance, whether you put those in and how you put them in. Uh, so some of the key strengths to the Act would be it's very easy to set up, it's very low cost. Uh, you can adapt it very easily to the unique needs of that individual. Uh, obviously the reliance of the relationship of trust and that being embedded within the law. Uh, the legal authority. And again, and this would be the same for any SDM legislation, that it needs to be very clear that you are making decisions based on your interpretation of what that person would choose and not what you think is their best interest, which would be a typical supported substitute decision making standard. Uh, we also, I won't go into this, we also have a registry, uh, voluntary registry uh, that people can embed their documents in, so if you're in hospital or something and the physician or the healthcare team needs to find it, they can search this online database. Okay, so what are the key pieces? Uh, I think I've probably touched on most of them. Uh, obviously you need an enforceable and easily accessible legal framework that guarantees people the right to make decisions for, them health, for themselves and the right to have support to make that decision. 
the recognition of alternative means of communication we talked about, uh, recognition of the relationship of trust, this relational capacity issue, uh, the means to develop strong support networks, particularly for those who lack those relationships right now, uh, the integration of uh, supportive decision making into daily practice. Sometimes when we talk about this, we tend to focus on the big decisions, the healthcare decisions, the moves, the financial. But really, it's probably more important to embed in the day-to-day -day life of a person. Where you go in the evening, what do you eat, who you want to hang out with, all of those kind of things. Um, you know, having a system of support for development, but also the registration of documents is, is a useful thing. One of the, uh, are advanced care directives big here? People get really excited about them. The only problem with them is they don't work. And the reason they don't work is nobody can find them when they need them. And, uh, and there, there is quite strong empirical evidence to support that statement. Uh, so some system of registration that healthcare providers, people are aware of, well where do I go to find this agreement is a really useful piece. A bit like a wills registry. Uh, you know, some mechanism for dispute resolution, uh, for oversight and protection. Uh, again, I think most jurisdictions have things in place that could easily be adapted to include this. Uh, I did that one. Right. So I think that's about it. Uh, so thank you. And I look forward to your questions. So we've got uh, time for a few questions, which Tim's happy to answer. So you happy to do that or do you want me to do that? Sure, I can do that. That's yeah. Sure. Shane has mine. Tim, on Section 7, you mentioned that there was some sort of legal paraphernalia. Uh, the problem we have in this state is that we do have legal capacity for substitute decision makers except there's not only the banks that don't recognise it, it's pretty well everybody in the corporate sector. Mm. And the frustration level with parents. You know, I really don't want guardianship because to me, guardianship starts to block supportive decision making. Mm. And I've seen that happen with people who have had guardianship over them. So it's really, it's really a matter of, of education. You know, bankers aren't necessarily the brightest sparks in the campfire, but if you take your time, they'll usually get there. So, sorry, that was a Canadian expression. So. <laughs> you, you don't have a, a document or anything like that by the that you follow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
Australia is further ahead than Canada in that area, that there are some very good, strong community advocacy groups, citizen advocacy groups. So, yeah, I think it's certainly one of the tools you want to try to use. So. Gentlemen up front here. Hello. Look, I'm just wondering if there's been one of the difficult issues I face is when you take an enduring power terminal to the bank and you have to get some decisions. Every bank has a different policy. So you can't actually pre-prepare for that. And I'm wondering whether you've done any work to have some common agreement between different flavors or brands um, in terms of what is required when and somebody needs to make some financial decisions on their behalf. Yeah, we, we did work mainly with the federal government on this to get into the banking regulations that they all have to adhere to. So working on that that level and that, that brings a greater level of comfort to the banks. Now you still would probably have to do some education at your local branch that, well no actually section 7 of the banking regulations say here this is a valid document. So we did we kind of did work at that level rather than go bank to bank to bank to bank to try to get it in the, the regulatory framework for the banks. And, and clarification, because I mean, we all have an interest in the banks being cautious. So I mean, I, I, I'm making light of it, but you know, they have their due diligence. Thing. So the clearer that can be and the clearer that can be embedded in regulations that they're, they're covered, <laughs> the easier it'll be for you. You made the statement that the um, CRPD says that substitute decision making should be replaced. Can you point out where in Article 12 it actually says that so clearly? It it says it doesn't say it in those words, but the language of it that it doesn't say people are usually seen as legal persons. It says very clearly that people with disabilities are persons before the law. It doesn't say sometimes. It doesn't say when they can do X, Y, and Z. It says persons before the law, period. So that, to me, in the way that, that many, most people have interpreted that, it's not, it, there aren't exceptions. So it's not a presumption of capacity that can be disproved. It's a foundational assumption that everybody has legal capacity. Now, certainly a lot of the write-up about it and the, uh, uh, call the uh, committee on the convention has clarified that multiple times, that, that their view, what Article 12 requires, is an elimination of all forms of substituted decision making. But because of the reservations, they realize that's not going to happen quickly or across the board. But, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact word of the candidate. It doesn't say sport of decision making is the only thing that's good. But logically, to me, the, and the way it's been interpreted, the way this, the statement is very clear about legal personhood, and it's not equivocal and it's not bracketed. One more? Tim, one of the things that we have here are jurisdictional issues between federal <coughs> legislation and state legislation. And our Banking Act and a lot of the issues that we see are around banking and, and finance. Banking is a federal responsibility yeah. and much of our um, guardianship is a state-based responsibility. Do you have that same issue in Canada and how did you get around it? Yeah, we're exactly the same. The, 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 the bank regulation is a federal responsibility and 
guardianship, all those kinds of things are provincial responsibilities. In some way it made it easier for us to address this issue with the banking because we could deal solely with the federal and only change one set of regulations. Uh, so it's the same, pretty much the same structure for us. Uh, but but in, that, in that case, it, it actually made it a lot easier.